at Matters of the Soul. <clears throat> we work with your soul. Now, what we're doing is uh, we help you develop your emotional intelligence through Christian psychology media content. And tonight I'm talking about a very serious topic, um, and that one of suicide. Um, and it's about suicide, and and the question is, is this life worth living? And um, so I'm going to share tonight um, about what suicide is. I'm going to tell you a bit more about some of the factual things about suicide, but then I'm also going to uh, talk to the person who uh, contemplates suicide or who has tried to commit suicide. And I'll also be sharing some um, of my thoughts and heart on um, the person who has lost somebody due to suicide. Um, and I'm trusting the Lord to comfort you and to work with you. So during this program, I'm going to try and also assist you um, when you have somebody in your life that is talking about suicide or wants to commit suicide, what you should do. Okay, so this will also not be just a one-hour program. So I'm going to talk until I'm finished talking. And you, what you can do is you can watch this uh, on the go. So when you are ready, you watch it, you pause it, you watch it, you play. So you do that um, and in, in that kind of way. So I'm deeply aware that um, <clears throat> there is a, that there is, sorry, there's some message here. Okay, I can't do anything about that. I'm not technical. Um, so what is happening is there there's a whole host of um, things to say about about suicide and, and and how it affects people. And I must tell you that it uh, during my years as a, a clinical psychologist, I've had so many. You know, um, I've had to deal with suicide from, you know, on such a broad scale um, during my practice years, uh, talk, working in a clinical psychology environment at a psychiatric hospital. I dealt with it on a daily basis. And personally, I've been at that uh, precipice, at that threshold place of looking down the deep, dark hole um, and feeling that pulling factor into suicide. I've, I've had that um, a number of times during the times that I really struggled with burnout and depression. So I understand it from a personal point of view as well. And, and I must tell you, it is difficult. So I want to, my idea tonight is to offer some insights, hope, hopefully, as to what suicide is and what it is, what the problems that people experience with suicide. Um, why they commit suicide, why they try and do that. And then for us, especially as Christians, how do we deal with it? And then also the, the question of whether Christians, uh, what, what happens to them when they commit suicide. Now, I'm not a theologian, but I am a Christian, and I've done some studying work on this, and, I, and I'd just like to share some thoughts, because I think for somebody who is, if you've lost a family member to suicide, uh, it leaves you with questions. And I've got some coffee. Uh, good coffee, I might add. <laughs> okay, so let's have a look at suicide then. <clears throat> you know, if you're at a place where you feel hopeless and you feel like um, there's just no change in your situation and things are not getting better, um, I hope that for throughout tonight's program that it'll, there'll be some glimmers of hope for you as well. Um, there's a beautiful verse that I'd like to start with in 2 Corinthians um, 1 verse 8 to 10 where Paul talks and he and, and now the remember this is Paul the apostle that has endured I mean five beatings uh, he was stoned to death he was he, he was drift adrift at sea for three days and nights uh, he was stung ah, he, he just went through so much hell and he said this he said for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You can hear that he felt utterly desperate. 
and he saw no way out. And then he said, but he understood in that situation that the only way there is down, but down on his knees, down on his face and to say, Lord, I need you. I'm, I need to trust in you. You are beyond death. I feel like I cannot go on anymore, but you're the one who can save me. And he says he delivered us. So he experienced a deliverance. And then he that gave him hope to say, but I'm going to be delivered again and again. And then he confirms I've set my hope on him. He will deliver me again. So what I'm praying is that you will experience a deliverance. If indeed it starts with the way you perceive your situation. If it starts there, at least that is already a good starting point. Now, when you feel suicidal, um, it's difficult because when when people go through suicidal um, ideation, but I'm, I want to look at some of the definitions of it. So I'm going to do some teaching in between in between this. It's not a lecture on suicide, but I, I have to also give you some structure on this and some, some information on what happens and uh, some of the stats and those things, so that you can just see how it works. But when you're in a place of suicide, you feel so um, utterly hopeless, and it, your your thinking is clouded by depression and anxiety and hopelessness. Your logical reasoning is clouded. You start to f think differently. It's as if you, you get that tunnel vision, you get narrow vision, where you think, I don't know if I'm going to make it. I don't know how to get out of this. I can't get out of this. I I will not get out of this. It, it, it's as if in time, if it's happened for a long time now, you've been battling with this, it's been going on, and there's unbearable pain. That's what the research also shows. There's unbearable pain. It's the reason that most people commit suicide. Is the, they call it psych ache. Your mind is aching from pain, and then you feel like, I just cannot do it anymore. I want to commit suicide. So when, you go, when you're in that place, your, your mind actually, the way you perceive your situation changes uh, and you tend to magnify the negative and minimize the positive. And some people say, but I felt fully calm and relaxed and logical. Yes. And we'll have a look at why that is the case because some people, as soon as they've decided they've got this solution, they suddenly feel calm. But it's, it's not a um, um, it's not a calm that is based upon um, other <clears throat> options or other solutions. It's it's a it's a calm because they've actually decided now I'm going to commit suicide. Um, now that is just the case with some people, but you know um, <clears throat> there's um, there's a lot of a lot of statistics on this, and I just want to add some of those things. In the in the world, they estimate about between 800,000 and a million people commit suicide every year. Now, in saying these things and giving you, and talking about suicide, some people might actually be stirred up to think more about suicide. Now, that is one of the myths as well. But there is sometimes a risk that I don't want to, what I want to do is to actually highlight the pandemic of suicide and how tragic it is. Now, um, it, it, it actually uh, is, it is within uh, young people that are between 15 and 24 year olds. It's the third leading cause of death. And um, males obviously commit more suicide than females, but females attempt more. And, um, and there's been a 30% increase in suicide rates over the last, uh, from the year 2000 through to 2016 a 30% increase that's quite a lot and um, for every suicide successful suicide there's actually many more who attempt it and um, a lot of and then for every attempt there's many more who consider it so um, there's a whole host and it's like a slippery it begins here with with being under pressure now I just want to look at some of the definitions for those of you um, who are working with this as well. Suicide or completed suicide is the act of taking one's life. Um, attempted suicide then obviously is that suicidal behavior where there's self-injury with a desire to end your own life, but it doesn't result in that. And suicidal ideation is when you're thinking of ending your life, you, you're con contemplating it. Sometimes some people um, get almost get stuck on 
on those thoughts. Now, those are different from assisted suicide when you actually help somebody bring about their own death indirectly. Uh, or, um, or, or euthanasia is where another person takes a more active role in bringing about a person's death. Now, there are myths concerning suicide, and I'm just going to touch on a few of them. Um, and and it's, it's quite shocking that <clears throat> these are actually around there, but, you know, we have to address these myths. People who are talking about suicide are just bluffing. I think that's quite horrendous. Um, what we've been taught in our clinical training is that you take every suicide, um, every suicidal warning seriously. You don't just negate people because... Uh, you know, they've been saying it for so long. Um, yes, it's difficult when people, you know, they talk about it for a long time or they just don't talk about it. But it, it, you can't just ignore the fact that they've now said it for the hundredth time and now you're feeling like, oh man, just go and do it. And I heard something uh, quite shocking last week, uh, as fresh as last week, that the lay the guy person said he, he felt like he was so depressed he wanted to commit suicide and his wife just said, let me give you the gun. Uh, so, I mean, that's cruel, um, but that's, that shows you how it's some of the suicide is, for, is based in relationships as well. So we'll look at the causes as well. Or that people who take their own lives are crazy, and that's a judgment that is very simplified, and that is, uh, that is an overgeneralization and oversimplification of the issue, sh showing that there's not a lot of understanding or compassion for those persons. That does not mean that some people do not struggle with some kind of mental difficulty or um, even manipulative behavior. And we'll have a look at those ones as well. But it's not, it doesn't mean that you're crazy if you're thinking of suicide. It just means you're under stress and you're under, you're in distress. Or there's another one when a person has made up his mind to kill himself, you won't be able to stop them. They're going to do it. Look, any intervention is a chance at changing it and, and, and maybe stopping it. And any intervention might help. So rather try than just ignore it. Uh, or people who try to commit suicide don't really want to be helped. They just, um, they're just looking for attention. Um, some people who commit suicide do look for attention. There is uh, that factor. Um, because suddenly somebody who's committed suicide receive this honorable almost you know there's lots of talk about them and, and memorials and stuff and now it's just you know when you're in that place of deep distress and illogical thinking you can see it that way but this is not the general thing that people who try to commit suicide don't want to be helped it's rather a cry for help or that um when you talk to people who are suicidal about suicide then it's going to make it worse um it does bring things to the forefront and it does bring it into the open into the open but it doesn't mean that it's going to prompt them now to do it um, it actually could prompt them to seek help rather than avoid it avoidance means you have not actually tried and they're left it there to their own devices and uh, to the in their own thoughts and that's part of the problem is that their own thoughts are are harassing them at the moment and it's toxic so what do you want to watch out for when, when you know somebody who is, is wanting to commit suicide? So if you have people in your life who wants to commit suicide, I've spoken about it, or you yourself have tried, but just for those people who want to help other people who are uh, who want to reach out to them, there are some warning signs. And did you know that 8 out of 10 people who commit suicide actually gave a distinct warning of some kind? Now, we're, you're not a psychologist probably, and you're... Um, or some trained counsellor or a social worker. So, you you know, sometimes we might miss those things. And um, But it's good to know some of the warning signs. And, not, and these warning signs, just to say, doesn't mean that the person is planning definitely but on suicide because suicide is a complex thing. It's like drug abuse. Um, sometimes the person might lose weight, you know, do those things. And, and sometimes it's not because of drug abuse, it's because of an illness. So, you know, you just need to take into consideration all of the factors. But making plans for suicide, talking about it, saying in anguish or anger, I kill myself. Um, you know, becoming very depressed with no hope. Saying things like, it's not going to change ever, or I doubt, you know, I can't go on like this. Things like that. Um, 
when, when, when there's lots of self-hatred and self-loathing and, and her harming themselves, or they're talking about feeling like a burden. Research has recently confirmed that as well. Um, and they start to isolate themselves from other people and they become more anxious and distressed. And it seems like they are trapped in pain. Now, sometimes for men, they tend to either have outbursts or keep it inside women tend to manifest physically like physical problems like pains and aches and illnesses and they become very depressed and um and there's there might be more substance abuse like drinking more so if you find these things in yourself it's also a warning sign for you that you just need to take care now of yourself um but that's one of the problems is that you struggle to take care. But we'll have a look at that as well. The main thing is that they feel trapped um, in a situation. Or they, sometimes if you see them looking for lethal means, they're, you know, suddenly they are depressed and now they're looking to get a gun. Um, or you see strange kinds of poisons that, that that's in the house. Or there's more fits of rage or anger or mood swings or, and they're saying that they can't, that they are they are upset or they 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 talk about doing something to themselves and they are expressing how bad life is and and they and, and, and things are out of control their sleeping patterns they they um, or they start to say goodbye to people they start to give away treasured possessions and 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 they they do things that hurt themselves and or they start to also with all some of these things they also start to get things in order you can see they are doing this they're doing that they're starting to plan and um and 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 to 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 uh, sort things out and all those things are is a cry for help if you get, if you put it together you can see there's a person in that's desperate now some people are very quiet about this and you don't even see it you don't even realize that they'll do it because it's inside there's a volcano bubbling and it's about to burst and i understand that this is um, extremely difficult i've had one of my clients um committed suicide and um, he, he had this preoccupation with death the week before he's he's and the way he's suicide and the way it manifested is that he watched these programs about death and the um and supernatural things and afterlife and he <clears throat> he was fixated on it and uh, and locking himself into the house and into the room you know uh, doing things that are not in, uh, not okay that are not that's not usual okay so what we want to do is we want to figure out how this works now if you if you're at a place where you feel i just cannot go on you feel like uh, paul said there it's it, it's like I'm desperate. I cannot go on. And it's <clears throat> what's important is that you that you acknowledge where you're at. And uh, and in a sense, I mean, mean you know where you're at. You know you're feeling desperate. But it's about then saying, why do I want to die? What is the, what's the reasons? That's the one. That's the one end of the conversation. The other end is, why would I want to live? And sometimes when I've spoken to people. Um, who's tried to commit suicide <clears throat> they usually tell me they don't actually want to die they want to get out of the situation and that's what we'll see with some of the causes so when i talk about the causes i again use the biopsychosocial spiritual model i like that i think it covers all the areas biological psychological social spiritual so let some of the biological reasons why people commit suicide, I think it, there's obviously sometimes a neurological um, reason in that sense that there's depression, um, <clears throat> a, a clinical, chemical, chemically based depression. Uh, go and let, have a look at my, my program on the causes of depression and how to deal with that. You can, you can find the link in the description as well. <clears throat> what we'll do is, is there you with depression you see there's a biological and sometimes medication might induce suicidal thoughts um, and that can also lead to some suicide some people who have have committed suicide um, that was actually induced by some medication or if I've had lots of my clients who told me they had to switch from this medication to another one because they got increasing suicide thoughts because it works on your brain 
But medication tends to tend to help a bit more than it does not. It helps more. And then I've had people commit suicide who had chronic pain, uh, people who had terminal illnesses or an illness and a diagnosis of a very painful, long, traumatic illness that lies ahead and they've committed suicide. Um, <clears throat> and then people who have had other mental illnesses like schizophrenia or they had psychotic breaks where they, where they lost contact with reality. And then psychologically, there's this huge key one, the unbearable mental pain, like I said. I think that's the primary re reason that people want to get away from feeling like this. They don't can't continue feeling like this anymore. And they just want to escape this unbearable pain. And, and, the, and sometimes it's also loneliness. Maybe you feel lonely or hopeless. Um, but, or you think that people will not care. They, they don't care in any way. So what, what does it matter um, that you feel rejected by people and hurt? And maybe you've been hurt tremendously. <clears throat> you know, some people's personality traits uh, tend to set them up a bit more for, for being uh, suicidal. Now, this is not an excuse or to say, yeah, it's because of this from my personality. But you know what? Some people with OCD kind of rigid anxiety related compulsive behaviors, impulsive impulsivity or their avoidance of, of, of problems and feelings. And impulsivity means they do things on the on the uh, spur of the moment. They just do without thinking. And they sometimes just, you know, drink a bottle of wine or they spend money on, and they're impulsive. Or they've got this difficulty to sort out their emotions and to what we call regulate their emotions. So it's difficult to um, to manage emotions, these intense emotions of anger and frustration and hurt, you know, and and then sometimes there's also difficulties with decision making. People who struggle with making decisions um, and who struggle to take um, control of their lives in that way, or to solve problems like they they it's difficult for them to solve problems. They may might struggle with anxiety or. It's just that they, they've got limited options sometimes, but also sometimes limited um, psychological confidence to sort out some problems. And then obviously some other um, psychiatric things like bipolar mood disorder, when a person has started to hurt themselves physically, like burning, cutting, that's, that's almost on the way to suicide. And then one of the ones that I've seen that's quite common is addiction. So when people have been addicted to, and I've seen a number of people committed suicide with, with drug abuse and, and alcohol abuse they feel so stuck in this pattern and they can't get out or there's social reasons like there's real struggles financially I just heard about it two days ago um, um, a man lost most of his money in his uh, late 50s early 60s mo lost most of his money in business and shot himself and that was the so he f he saw no way out of that. He saw no future, and he was um, he was distraught. Um, or or there was areas where you feel felt like you failed in your schoolwork, in your uh, uh, you know academically, or even in your career. I'm, I'm a failure. I didn't make a success of this. And uh, what's the point of going on? And you know what? Our emotions can sometimes overwhelm us when we're in that situation, and become so in tense that it feels like it's it's just flooding us and in that moment it feels true that i must commit suicide it feels like this is the way out the only way out it seems like it's just this door in front of you and then you know what the devil is so so cunning to keep on pushing you to tell you do it you can't go on anymore so you'll have these hopeless thoughts that's also induced by depression but also the enemy and it just pushing you to say, just do it. And uh, we'll have a look at what the Lord also says. Because he says, cry out to me. And then, you know, when I was in that place, I also felt like there was no other way out. I couldn't bear that pain. And I couldn't go, I couldn't see a way out of my, my distressing situation. My finances crashed my work. I just saw my whole life tumbling and I, and I, I felt so anxious. I could... Uh, it was terrible, and I just felt like I, if I leave, if I commit suicide, I will. It will be over. 
So that's the lie that comes in as well. I call it a lie because in that moment it seems true. But we'll have a look at what happens um, in that impulsive, intense moment. It seems like there's no other way out and I just have to do it. But if you could just see see it through that little that area, that time when your emotions are flooding and just wait till the seas have calmed and start to share the, with somebody, especially somebody professional, you might find that you, you view it a bit differently later on than what you viewed it there. But you know what, we'll have a look at what you can do as well. Many a times people feel so hurt by rejection and... Um, when they've been uh, got, when they've went through a divorce or there was an affair in the relationship, um, I, I, in my own practice, there were two uh, men who, com who committed suicide after a divorce. Um, the rejection was too intense for them, and it felt like their whole lives just collapsed, and there was no reason to live anymore. And you know what? That's what pain does. Is at that moment it feels like it. You heard Paul also say that. Moses said it to God, Elijah said it, Jeremiah said it, that at that point they feel so intensely distressed that it seems like death is better. But you don't know whether death is better. You don't know. Um, if you're, We're going to talk about Christians and, and suicide, but meaning at that point you think death is going to be better. But who says it's going to be better? Uh, you don't even have evidence for that. You think you're going to be better. You don't know. Um, if you're a Christian, you have a different point of view on that. Um, and, it, and it hooks to the spiritual side. So we'll get there. But, but when you reject it, many a times one wants to end the relationship. But again, there's been many people who were there. And they just kept on walking. Uh, I recently did a, um, a nice hiking trail. And we had to cross a river at a certain time. Um, and the the secret almost or the key thing that we had to do was to keep on walking you shouldn't stop in the middle of crossing that river because the water comes in and the tide comes in and the longer you wait the stronger the tide becomes so you have to keep on walking through that river to the other side and um, that's almost like driving through the storm you have to keep on driving. If you park in the middle of the storm, the water will be there for a longer time. But if you just keep on, keeping on, keep on, keeping on, it doesn't mean that the storm will just go away like this, but it, but that what's actually happening is the storm will start to move away. You will move through the storm. Sometimes the storm is yourself. You are the storm. You are creating a storm in your mind and in your heart. But even there, the Lord will help you and can help you and you can be helped. You know, I doubt whether there is one cause of suicide that cannot be helped. I'm not blaming people who have committed suicide here. I'm not trying to pile on the guilt. But I'm trying to give hope that they, they I don't know of one problem that, that there's not some kind of help. Even if it then only be spirit, well not that spiritual help is a lesser help, but if it's if it's not an immediate change of the situation, there's always hope. And especially in the Lord, who is all-encompassing. He's outside of time and life. And he's stronger than anything here. But from our perspective, it sometimes seems that it is just, it just not going to change. You know, there might be some other reasons why people commit suicide or they try to. And this is a hard one. They punish other people, and I've had this in my practice, one person who punished other people through his suicide. That was his main thing, and he did not really take ownership for his own anger and um, for his own problems. So what he did is he, he vented it on other people. And I'd like to point out here that um, I'm not judging the, the person, I'm, but what they did is they caused a lot of destruction, not only to themselves, but to others as well. Or they punish themselves. They feel so much guilt and self-loathing and shame that they commit suicide. And sometimes some people really do crave attention. And it's a, it sounds illogical, but some of the research have shown this. 
it's and it's not like you're just seeking attention it is actually they're they're actually seeking acknowledgement and confirmation of their existence of being worth worthy of being loved and being important those things and then manipulation some people really manipulate through suicide now people tell me isn't it every time isn't every suicide a manipulation no every suicide's not a manipulation but it does it could have a manipulative uh, um, air to it almost some people use it as a, a threat to say if i'm not going to get this oh, i'm going to kill myself really if you use that that is that is cruel and nasty um, if you try and uh, manipulate other people by saying you're going to commit suicide what you're doing is, is you are con trying to control them and to pile on the guilt to say it's going to be their fault. That is just unacceptable. It remains your choice. And what is sad there is that I then often at times have to tell the wife or the husband when their spouse manipulates them that way. And then I had a lady two or three weeks ago, her husband said this to her. So my response was, what you say to him then is, that because he does not want to take ownership for his life and his problems and acknowledge his side of the problem and work on it he just wants to to manipulate it to, her to do what he wants to do and um he get it get his way and then try and blame her and then I, what i said is she should handle it this way by saying i understand that you are upset and that you don't like what i'm saying but if you are going to commit suicide it's going it will be a very tragic thing and it will be tragic for me too, but I cannot accept responsibility for your choices. I cannot take ownership for the fact that you choose to commit suicide. It will remain your choice. I'm here to help you, and I'm here to be to to uh, to assist you in any way I can. But I cannot take responsibility for your choice. If 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 you choose to kill yourself, it is then your responsibility. So it's harsh. It's not harsh, actually. It's actually fair, but it is a, a firmer stance because one has to stop that kind of manipulation and then say, I'd rather us reach out for proper help because that person is angry and upset. And sometimes some people are, are allow themselves to be controlled by their emotions and not just by, not by thinking through their emotions. Now, it's not as simple as that, but it is also as simple as that. Um, and then there's also grief. Some people just feel like they cannot continue anymore and they want to be with their loved ones. And it's a part of being alone as well and, and missing people. Um, but again, that does not, it, it's as if people tend to idealize death then and say, but that is going to be the ultimate solution. And some Christians having a an expectation of heaven will then say, but it's going, I'm going to be with them in heaven and Although it is true, but it, 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 it's not necessarily God's will. I, I would say then, but you're going to end up, when you die, you're going to stand before the Lord and he's going to ask you, what are you doing here now? You know, I don't know that for sure, but I'm saying that it might be, you know, you're going to see the loving Lord and he loves you and he cares for you, but you're going to, it's not as if he's going to sweep everything under the rug. There's obviously, it's going to be known that you have just committed suicide and you know, you're there you know, um, by this means. So there might, there will be a discussion, and I know the Lord, Lord's heart, and we'll talk about that a bit later as well. It's just not to be, to think that um, it's nothing. It's not going to be anything. It's not going to be, I'm not saying it's going to cost you your salvation. That is not what I'm saying. But I'm saying you can't just underestimate it or just say that it is not important or you're not going to have to, stand before the Lord and talk about this um, so you have to the Lord also says we take we have to take ownership for our lives and we're going to give an account of our decisions and I'm not again um, I know some people have lost family members who are Christian but I'm talking about those who are still here just to consider this and then obviously it's an escape from a difficult situation my question to people who have tried to commit suicide was very often, do you want to die or do you want to get this situation to end? 99 out of 100 would say, I want the situation to end. It's not that I don't want to live. I have lost the will to live. Many a times it's actually wanting some, some painful thing to change. 
did you know that obviously there there will would have been in that person's life there would have been a lot of stressors or there's a lot of stress if like you've lost your job there's been lots of family fights people have passed away there's been you've been affected by violence crime abuse it's been terrible i had a lady who's who lost two family members on one in one day and who just felt like she just uh, lost her job as well it just things just felt so hopeless and then there was uh, a marriage marriage that also collapsed and then she said but i just don't want to live anymore so you see losses can also bring upon about a lot of hopelessness but uh, there was a way beyond that for her so it is it doesn't mean that your life ends there again it is continuing through the storm did you know with children just to give you some ideas with children uh, you many, the research shows that many a times it's adversity adversity tough situations and trauma that leads them to feel anxiety and depression and and bullying um, bullying 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 and um, and then thinking of suicide as a way out did you know that the research also shows that a strong f attachment to your father um, actually reduces the risk of suicide when there's bullying and and depression it's just interesting um, that's what i always say is if your children's there your relationship with them is a is a key factor yes you cannot always prevent it you can try everything possible but i know there are some parents who've lost lost children to suicide and it's tragic and my heart really goes out to you because it i can't imagine being in that situation and i also want to speak to your heart but later on and then you know self-criticism if if children are very critical of themselves or they become very dependent as well and or both and um if there's been neglect of them and, and abuse uh, that's also associated with high suicide risk and and sometimes um you know if they if, if they have those things and if they've experienced a lot of violence especially uh, sexual violence as well now i'd like what i'm what i what i'd like to also do is just to with you also have a look at just some of the things that you what you can do I just want to, so sorry about that, just for, first want to stop at some spiritual reasons why people commit suicide. You know, Psalm 34 verse 17 to 20 says the following, When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones. That's prophetic of Christ. Not one of them is broken. Can you hear that the righteous cry for help? That means they're in such a desperate situation that they need to cry. But it promises that the Lord hears and that he delivers you out of all your troubles. When I was in that place, I remember crying out to the Lord. And it wasn't once. I cried many times. And it did feel like the Lord was not listening. I must be honest, I didn't feel like... Because it... I was crying many a times. Sometimes I just felt like, why, why does he not deliver me? I've, it's almost as if I wanted him to touch me and to take it all away. But what I missed in my desperation and anxiety was that he was actually talking to me many times, but I was so clouded with emotion. And what happened is, is I would not become quiet before him because I was just so distressed and down and depressed. But the Holy Spirit did touch me and the Lord did help me every time. But it didn't, it, it wasn't a quick fix. And now I'm not trying to break your hope, I'm trying to give you a realistic perspective. But in the process, he did come and help me. He did. That's why I'm sitting here today talking to you and trying to instill hope in your life because he helped me he did he did hear me and he did deliver me out of my troubles what he actually what i actually found when i was going to him more and more that i heard him more and more and that i became more sensitive to him and he sent people my way he sent uh, trained people to help me and he sent he just helped me in the ways that i needed help and he is still helping me i'm not saying that i don't feel those feelings in sometimes 
even two days ago I was lying on my bed after some difficult uh, situations that I had to, that I went through this last week. And I just felt distressed and upset. And I remember just talking to the Lord, just saying, Lord, at the moment my feelings are just so upset and anguish and I, I feel like I just want to come to you. I don't want to deal with this anymore. I mean, that's honest. I just said it to him. I just said, like, I can't go on like this anymore. I don't want to. But I was upset about situations and stress and pressure. But the Lord turned it around and he, did, he helped me practically solving difficult situations. And he sent his word and healed me. He sent his word to encourage me. And he, and he spoke to me, and, I, and, and that's in the relationship with him. He wants a relationship with you, and you can have a relationship with him. He says, all of those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Call on his name. Seek him, and you will find him. He says, draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. He is already looking for you. That's why God sent his son to earth. He says, God so loved the world, that's you, that he gave his one and only son, so that for whoever, whoever believes in him shall be saved and uh, won't won't perish forever. And he says, I didn't come to the world to, to condemn it, but to save it. He is coming to you to save you. But you need to be open and honest and accept it. And it starts with a small little bit of faith, like a mustard seed, just a, a little bit of trust. Um, now, I, I remember being in that position where I was so distraught and so depressed and hopeless. And I, and the pastor, when I was in the church, he said, can you trust God just one more time? And I, it, it was like scraping together all of my hope. Because I've become cynical by then. I would become cynical. I uh, lost my, my, my conviction of the Lord's faithfulness. And I gave him that piece of faith and he touched me um, a month after that the holy spirit touched me in my bedroom but then he started to work with me and deal with my thoughts and my priorities and my my self-care and my relationships and my work and and it's been it was sorted out and he's still sorting out but i've got lots more hope but do i sometimes feel like this sometimes i do sometimes christians also commit suicide because of the other reasons but sometimes there are unanswered questions about God they have feel rejected by God himself as well because the Lord has tarried, tallied he's, 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 ta <laughs> he's taken a long time to help he, uh, he has it, it, it seems like he's not listening but he is or there's been involvement in the occult and you know the occult Satanism uh, Wicca all kinds of new age practices can in, invite demonic activity in your life, and demonic activity is the, um, what the it's the if effect of sin. So the effect of sin is death, meaning spiritual death, um, emotional death. The enemy brings death into your life, and that is sometimes the, the some people are plagued by the occult, and um, also traditional beliefs. Some. <clears throat> Some traditional believers um, or, or, or people being coming involved in those occult practices as well. And then there's people who have spiritual guilt and they have guilt about sin and about being worthless. And, it, and sometimes it's lacking not really knowing the word that you are loved and that you are accepted by God just as you are. It doesn't mean that God accepts sin, but he has dealt with sin on the cross. Now he wants to give you his righteousness and he wants you to experience that release from the guilt and that forgiveness. And it and it's free and it is grace. It is not a you cannot you, even if you've tried to commit suicide, which is an it is sin. It is taking your life. But for the Lord, he says, You are more worth more. I've given my own life to get your life. So he doesn't want you to take your life. He wants your life, but he wants you alive. If I can say it that way, He wants to live through you. And if you if you know Jesus and you have a relationship with Him, and the Holy Spirit indwells you, but you feel like this, it's because your soul is under a lot of pressure. Your mind, your thinking, your feelings, but you've got a spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in you, and He wants to live through you. And the Spirit is strengthened by the Word, and the Word that is spoken by the Spirit 
it's not just reading the Bible, it is having a relationship with the Lord by <laughs> when you read the Bible and when you pray in the Spirit. So I'm, my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will touch you and that you will experience His presence and that He will draw you close and that He will send His word forth to you and heal you, meaning it, it will touch your spirit. It's what I felt when I was in that church service there. The pastor was speaking the word and it was as if it was igniting in my heart. So I, because I gave the Lord that little bit of faith and that little bit of faith with the word just exploded in my spirit. It didn't make me feel like I was alive right there. It took time, but the Lord touched me. It's like it stirred something. And then there's questions of why I was born. Why was I born into this terrible world? I saw a program last week. Do you know, if you don't know the Lord, if you don't know that you were born with a purpose as part of his plan, it does not seem that way. You know that Paul the Apostle, at the end of his life, after experiencing so much tribulation for the Lord, I mean, I read it this last week. He was, he was arrested and he wasn't guilty by the Jews. And they took him to the Romans. And the Roman was just, uh, Roman, uh, whatever his name was, Felix, he was just trying to manipulate Paul to get money from him as a bribe. He left him in prison for two years and after he left to, an, to go to another post or position and somebody else took over from him, he left Paul in the prison some more. Similar things happened to Joseph. I mean, that's all unfair things. And you can ask questions there as to why does God leave me in such a terrible position? But that was the situation that God used for him to sit and write a lot of letters. Important letters that we actually use today that clarified a whole host of things. So it gave him time. So <clears throat> his faith was then put in the Lord, not in the situation. He didn't look for the solution in the situation, but in the Lord. And you know what? I, it's 2,000 years later and the Lord's still using those letters. Tonight even. So there's a reason why you are born. You're not just born for nothing. The Lord doesn't waste his time. Yes, there's seven and a half billion people on earth. It doesn't matter. God is infinite. So he wants to create you. Look at the stars. I mean, he created so many. But he knows them all by name. You know, so he knows you by your name. He says he has a plan for you to use you according to he, what he wants to use you, not just what you want to do, what he wants to do, because he knows best if you are a screwdriver or a hammer. You know, a screwdriver is not a hammer. Um, he wants to use you the way he made you for his purpose. And he will use that terrible situation, even though you can't see how he's going to use it. He will use it. So. I, between 1995 and 2000, I felt extremely desperate and I felt a lot of tension and, and, and anxiety and loneliness. And I was crying out to the Lord, asking him how he was going to help me here and how is he going to use this? And, he, and what he said to me is, I'm, I am preparing you on the one hand and I'm drawing you closer to me. So that's that dependence. I'm using the pain here to strengthen you. And later on, I will use it with others. And this is what's happening now. He's using that with others. So please don't switch off when the Lord is working there. Okay, so there's a question. Does God forgive suicide? There's no question here that suicide is a terrible tragedy. And it is it, it, it ends a life. It doesn't just um, postpone it. It ends it. Um, a life that God wanted to use most probably in another way. Now, I'm not saying God cannot use the suicide. He does. He actually uses it because God takes the broken pots and makes something from them. Now, the fact that I've not committed suicide doesn't mean that I'm better than those who did. But it means that God wants to use your life. I'm trying to prevent a suicide here. Um, did, but it, you know what? It, it's difficult to say that suicide isn't sin. Because when you're taking your, your own life, you're committing murder. Um, in Afrikaans, the, the original word is self-murder, self-death. Self, not self-death, self-murder. They are changing it now to self-death. But it is taking away the spiritual concept that it is murder. But they're trying to remain descriptive. But but it is it is taking away the the... They're trying to remove the guilt as well. But what it is actually doing is taking away the worth. 
because if it's just self-death, it's like cutting off a tree. It is not just a tree. It is a human life that has a lot of value. And because you're made in God's image, that means you, God set you above above animals and nature. And he says, for you, you are made in my image. But you are living in a broken world with broken circumstances. Some people live in horrible circumstances. I heard a story today when somebody told me how they grew up. And it was terrible. That they survived is a miracle. So, so sometimes your situation can be horrendous. And it, you can't see how the Lord is in that situation. But even if you can't see, He is there. He's the invisible God. And He is greater than that. And that, I remember a story of a lady who was raped by her, her um, stepdad numerous times from the age of 12 till 17 or so. And she uh, she passed away during an operation when she was in her 20s. And uh, she was before the Lord. And she asked the Lord, why did you allow this? And she said, what he did is he just showed his heart to her. His real self and unconditional love just, just, just came over her. And he just loved on her. Just to say that I'm not the I'm not the source of the pain, but I love you and I want to love you back to wholeness. Now back to the point. Um, so the Bible says that life is sang is sacred, and it says in the Ten Commandments, "You shall not commit murder," because that breaks down God's plan, and He's the author of life, and and He decides who who you know who dies and doesn't. He's the one who gives life. And humans are not supposed to. Uh, unless I'm not talking about judicial things here, but in the sense that you take your own life. Or, I'm not saying if somebody wants to shoot you, you can't defend yourself. I'm, I'm not there now. But God's heart is that you that you, and that He wants to give you life. He doesn't want to give you death. He wants to give you, but it doesn't mean He wants to give you a perfect life. I'm not, I'm not preaching health, wealth, and and, and a trouble-free life. What I'm saying is God wants to give you health. And he wants to provide for your needs. But there's going to be difficulty. But he wants to use the difficulty for his glory and for your good. And your good doesn't always mean you're going to get the Ferrari. It means that you have an, in, uh, an intense um, encounter with Christ. And you will get to know him more and show him more and dis put him on display. And let him live through you more. And intensely experience the Holy Spirit and love on others and be more in line with God's plan for your life and for his kingdom. Those things are working together for good. And then he will in any case look after you because he's a good, good father. But can a sin so terrible and grave as suicide destroy your salvation? You know what? In the word of God it's clear that when you have come to faith in Christ that your sins are forgiven. So all your sins are forgiven and it's no longer held against you. The Lord does not hold your sins against you. Now, the word says in Ephesians 2 verse 8 that God saved you by his grace when you believed. You can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. You cannot boast that nothing you do or didn't do um, makes you saved. It's faith in Christ. But then people say, but if he really had faith in Christ and was alive... Uh, you know, the fruit would be there. But you sin as well, and I also sin. So how can you say that? You know, we all do sin, and we've got to be honest about it, but it doesn't mean that that sin is now the sin that is that is the unpardonable sin. It is a sin indeed, but in a, the unpardonable sin is rejecting Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. What other way is there then left for you? So Paul explains that nothing can separate you from God's love. You know, I'm convinced that uh, neither, that nothing can separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will be, ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Yes, it is. I doubt whether it is God's will. I, I actually firmly believe that it isn't His will, according to the Scriptures as well, that you take your own life. Because your life is in the hands of the Lord. In His book is written the days of your life. And He has plans for your life. So you belong to Him. 
You don't belong to yourself anymore. He has bought you from out of sin and death. You are now his slave. You cannot decide of your own life. But he's a good uh, father and he's a good master. But the but to reject, to lose your salvation because of that is, I don't see it scriptural. Um, so blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is actually rejecting Christ as Lord and Savior. So you are, uh, when you turn to Jesus for forgiveness, you're made righteous by his blood, Romans 5 verse 9. And that covers your, all of your sins. Otherwise, you will have to earn your salvation. Okay, so I've said that. What is important? What can you do if you want to help somebody who is trying to commit suicide or wanted to commit or is talking about these things? You've now heard it. It's very frightening. It's it's quite scary to hear somebody say this. Um, I think you know you can be frightened to think what can I? What am I going to do now? I don't, I don't know what to do, and we want, we go into a panic. Um, and it's important that uh, what we do here is to say, listen, I have to I have to follow through, and to follow up on on these uh, warning signs that I've got, and I I have to take it seriously. Now I've had clients where it was purely just a way of telling me, listen, Erich, I want help. Um, it wasn't that they wanted to die, like I said. And sometimes it was just bluffing in the sense of they were they were upset and angry and they were saying things, but they were actually saying, I am I feel very hurt by what you said. I don't want to feel this pain. Why did you hurt me like this? I don't like it when you say these things to me. Please stop saying these things or I will do this and that. I'll have to leave. But what they then said is, I hate you. I, I'll sort of kill myself. Yeah. It was an emotional time and the emotions were speaking, but I still have to go and check. So you have to ask a few questions to just figure out um, that person, if that risk is imminent and they are trying something or that it is, you have to do something. I had a family who had to almost put the, you know, almost fight with a person to get the gun out of their hands. And it was a terrible experience, traumatic, but they had to do that. Um, imminent danger is where a person is in the possession of a weapon or pills or whatever and they want to follow through. So you do what you need to do. Yeah. You phone people, you get the police, the ambulances, whatever. You save their life. That's what you do. Uh, you grab them, you take them to hospital, you force them, but you save them their lives because at that moment they're impulsive, they're illogical. And uh, just be careful because they're illogical. They can also kill you in the process might be accidentally but just be just but you have to sometimes then use force necessary force not uh, not to hurt them or harm them but to help them um so try not to leave those people alone uh, try to remove all of the um, um, possible weapons that you can where they can hurt themselves and try to get an ambulance there as soon as possible and even the police if it's necessary because i've had one client who was throwing breaking everything in the house so he literally had an anger, more than an outburst. It was like a losing control. Um, if it's not imminent and it's not a crisis right now, what do you do? The first thing is that you've got to uh, you've got to approach the person in a loving, caring, tender way. That's going to be your attitude. If you want to stop them as well, it is. It's also a controlled, caring way, but firm. Controlled but firm as well. So you you try to remain there. No, I'm, no, what I'm saying is difficult because at that moment it's just chaos. But if it's not the chaotic moment, you somebody has just voiced this, they cannot go on anymore, they can't bear this anymore, then it's important to lend them your ears. Two ears, one mouth, double the listening, half the talking. Meaning you listen carefully. You listen for, to confirm suicidal thoughts. You listen, to, are they, do they have a plan? Have they thought of doing something? Um, you know, what kind of, what are, you don't want to go into depth with too much about what the reasons are for why they want to commit suicide in a sense that don't try to play the therapist, but offer them your presence, your comforting, loving presence and talk from your heart. Um, but, but try to, uh, but don't be afraid to ask, are you having thoughts of suicide? Um rather talk about it um, because you're not putting those ideas in their head in in, in fact what you're doing is um, asking will actually give you valuable information so that you know how to proceed and help them 
So you have to get the facts. You can follow up uh, if they say yes. You know, if, um, I have thoughts of suicide. You can say, have you thought about how you would like to do, how you would do it? Do you know what you need to carry out your plan? Do you know when you will do it? Meaning, you want to clarify the the risk analysis. Here. It's a risk assessment. Is the risk mild? Is it moderate? Is it severe? Is it extreme? Um, do they have a plan now, and what do they want to do? Many a person will say they don't have definite plans, or they don't, uh, or they don't have the nerve to do it. Or, but it's still a serious situation. You, uh, you, you, you still have to um, try to reach out to them. So you take their words as a plea for help, and you, uh, and you try and get them assistance. So, a professional help is the best way. Now I know most of you will then reach out, and many a pe people person has reached out to me in that way, and said, "Look." Our children have, our daughter said this, or my sister said this. I just want to accompany them to you. And they accompany them. And even though they wait outside, they've come along. And they've just said, would you just go and see the therapist once? Just go and see them once. I know that it's hard. And I know you don't feel like there's any hope left. Um, or there's any, because the question is usually, what will the therapist be able to do for me? What is talking going to help? And you say, I understand that it feels hopeless. And it seems like there's no way out, but there's, there might just be a way out. So sometimes, um, you know, um, if there's, uh, you might have your own fears of losing that friendship or, or that person becoming angry at you or losing it. So sometimes you don't need somebody else to be with you as well. But afterwards, if you've helped them, they might thank you. So the idea is to show empathy kindness in a non-judgmental way you know just to sit there with them and to listen they will probably say a lot of things that might seem a bit illogical because now that's where they're at or over emotional you know they might seem like they're blowing things out of proportion which they probably are sometimes but there's pain underneath there there's desperation and we want to focus on just acknowledging that it doesn't mean when you acknowledge it that they are now going to say, yes, it is true, I have to commit suicide. No, it's actually a relief because they're not so alone in this hole anymore. Somebody's there listening. It's breaking the silence. It's breaking that f place of desperation. And then you can s maybe share if you've had a similar experience and what has helped you. You speak from the heart. Um, you speak out of love and concern. And, uh, and, 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 and when you talking to them if they if they cry you can hold them you don't have to okay stop crying stop crying no 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 let them cry it's okay you know i've cried before people would slap me on the back oh, okay oh, okay you know they, they're actually uncomfortable with the crying but allow the crying because it's in a re release it's expression of emotion and that's the pent-up pain um and it's acknowledging what they're experiencing it actually helps them to process the thoughts and it may reduce their suicidal thoughts. It will not necessarily, it won't just explode now. They might explode, they might show more emotion. It doesn't mean that they're now more at risk. No, they're actually getting, showing those, that unbearable pain to you. So what you then do is you listen and you take care and you're there for them. Just some people are so stunned into silence almost there. So what you do is when you feel, when you hear that, you can just reflect on what you're hearing. I can hear that it is very very difficult and I can see that you you've experienced a lot of pain this is very painful for you and I can see that this has become very hard so because they're carrying this burden that they feel they can't take anymore now what you're doing is you're listening and they're venting feelings of despair and anger maybe even or they're saying nasty things about people because they're upset but in that they're actually lightening the load and afterwards you could maybe offer Say, could I offer you some thoughts on what I've heard? Um, maybe share some of my the things that I've realized as I'm listening to you. Then you could show some different kinds of perspectives um, and do it. And, and Because it's important sometimes a reframe, a different kind of way of looking at the situation might be extremely valuable. So you validate them, you're sympathetic, you're calm, you're patient. Doesn't mean... That you say, yes, it is a hopeless situation. There's no way out. Yes, I think it's no, it's not, it's not what you're doing. You're saying, yes, it is hard. I'm sitting here with you. I'm crying with those who's crying and I'm laughing with those who's laughing. I'm, I'm siding, I'm, I'm in this, I'm coming and sitting next to you. 
and I'm, I'm here for you. So what you're doing is you're, you're mirroring it for them, but you're also doing it in a compassionate way, and that brings a relief. It's almost like putting some, some ointment on a, on a, a painful sore. So what you want to also do is reduce their emotional burden by listening and giving them time to talk. Don't, don't talk too quickly. Don't respond too quickly. Uh, interrupt them. Just listen. And when there's a time, uh, respond. Um, so it's, the longer you keep them talking, the more you actually take the edge off the desperation. And, and, it, and it becomes harder for them to act on those feelings because they actually calm down and the impulsivity comes down. So you avoid to initially not solve the problem, avoid that too, because initially we'd like to give solutions and hope because we think it's going to give hope, but they actually need emotional relief first. And thereafter you offer that, you try, you ask, because a quick solution is belittling or it's it's almost like thumping their feelings and, and, and suppressing it. Now you would rather like to just sit with them and acknowledge the way they're seeing it and then say, can I offer you uh, my thoughts on the matter? And, would it be okay if I do this? Because some people are good at persuasion and they want to argue with this person and go into, no, but you can't do this or you, or they want to blame them and make them feel guilty or this is a selfish thing to do. You got, no, If you're going to go there, you're going to hurt them more. Look, they're wounded already. Uh, that's going to push them over. So rather step back and relax and listen and be kind. Um. Uh, rational arguments doesn't at that initially doesn't persuade them. And after a lot of empathy and acknowledgement, then a different perspective usually brings some kindness and brings some hope and relief. Um, so, and, and you know, what you also need to do is just to know that you also need support when you are dealing with people in your own life that's that's got suicidal ideation or have done this. You're, you need a friend or a therapist or your pastor or somebody who can who can also pray with you and help you and take care of you and um, sometimes um, it is very hard so what should you not do in such a situation when somebody wants to commit suicide what should you not do you shouldn't promise that you're going to keep this a secret you can't um, you can say I will listen to you um, and I will try to help you if I can but helping doesn't mean keeping it a, a secret. If they tell you you shouldn't tell anybody about this, don't tell anybody, then you can say, you know, I understand. This is very important for you not to let me tell anybody, but I care too much for you not to help you. So if I can do anything to help you, I will have to do it. I don't want to let you down. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to embarrass you or anything, so I'll do it in it through trusted channels. But if I have if I have to I I will and try not to not to um, not to help the person on your own for too long. So you're not the therapist. Try to get professional help there. And um, if they start talking about why they want to die and why they are feeling like this, sometimes it can become a huge discussion, um, and it might actually lead them then to become more suicidal. So you're listening to them, and then you're saying. Um, and then you make suggestions and you listen. Um, so it's important to, to, so if your friend is very upset and angry, to offer help as well, to then say, you know, I wonder, I can hear that there's a lot of things that you're sitting with. I might not be at the moment, I don't, I might not be the one who's able to help you with this, but I'm sure that there is somebody that is equipped and I, I will try to help find somebody for you that is equipped and I will go with you. Um, and, um, if you also say that, um, sometimes out of our sympathy, we want to say, I know exactly what it is like to go through that. If you do not ex exactly know, then say it a bit differently rather than say, I can, I cannot imagine how it is to go through that. And also don't ignore it and just go on, you know, or say, you know, I don't think it's really that rather act on it. <coughs> Sorry about that. <coughs> like, uh, <coughs> okay. Sometimes people commit suicide and the family and friends are left afterwards and it is devastating. Um, <clears throat> I recently worked with a whole family had lost their son to suicide and it, it was extremely hard for them. Extremely hard. I can just... 
It was, uh, they sat with a lot of grief, guilt, self-condemnation, blame, regret, anger, hurt, pain. A lot of mixed feelings. Sometimes you miss the person and you're angry at them. Sometimes you, you, regret, you have regret and you have relief as well. Sometimes it was such a tumultuous situation that there's even a sense of relief. It sounds strange, but that might even make you feel guilty as well. But what we want to do is not blame ourselves and go into judgment about this, but to acknowledge our feelings and to discuss openly with others the, what has happened. Not judgmental others, people who are genuinely concerned. We don't want to hide that they committed suicide. We, you, you need to talk about it because it relieves the burden. And it obviously elicits a lot of questions. People, are, all kinds of people are, are wondering what, what caused it, why did he commit suicide? He was such a this or she was such a that. Understand that. And sometimes you might not be at the place where you're ready to answer them. And you can then be honest about that too. Um, <clears throat> but it's important in time to be able to discuss it with trusted people. What's difficult here is that it is extremely difficult and hard and heart-wrenching blows that it is painful if you lose somebody to suicide. And you might have done some things that have hurt them and you might have contributed in a, in a sort of a way, but it always remains one's choice. In the end, the ultimate responsibility for that lies with the person because they made certain decisions. But what you need to do is if you have a family or friends who have lost somebody to suicide, to show compassion to them, to reach out Um and it's and not to blame them and to make them feel guilty or uh, and and then when there's a has been a death to when you when you honor somebody to also talk about it in such a way that you want to prevent suicide you want to be, be bring awareness to people's situations so that other people might be helped now if you're at the place where you are feeling desperate and you feel like you cannot go on anymore um i'd like to share some of my thoughts with you um, having been there myself, um, I must tell you and be honest with you that I'm thankful that I didn't do it. I would have missed out on my children, a wonderful wife. We're, we've been married 21 years now, and it's a beautiful relationship. It's not perfect. The family is not perfect. My life's not perfect. Um, I've got challenges, but I, I'm involving the Lord in all of my challenges. And I am trusting Him, and, and sometimes I do feel desperate. But um, I'm so glad I didn't do it because it would have been a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Those problems are in my past now. Really, they are. And I have to a degree, you know, I have actually overcome them. It doesn't sound, I mean, I didn't feel like it back then. And it surely, it was not a short-term problem, but it wasn't permanent. Now, I even had a client who was in a, in a motor vehicle accident and was then paralyzed from the neck down. And she told me, but this is permanent. And I said, yes, the physical condition is permanent, but not the mental condition. There you can grow. The spiritual condition also isn't permanent. So you can always grow there. And it does change things. And the Lord has even helped me with practical things like finances, like relationships like growing mentally psychologically becoming more mature spiritually but I'm still feeling tired sometimes and I still sometimes feel like I just can't bear this burden anymore but you know what I've learned to take it to the Lord and I've learned to go and cry before him and he hears me and in that process I've gotten to know his voice and his love it doesn't mean that I don't sometimes um, think that heaven will be better. I do. I actually long for heaven because life on earth isn't easy. It isn't easy. Even Jesus acknowledged it to say life here on earth is hard and it's going to be hard. Uh, but, but take courage. I've overcome this world, meaning in this crisis and in the life hereafter, I have hope for you. That I'm here with you in this terrible crisis and I can, I can use this crisis to give you eternal blessings and other people eternal blessings. In the end, he wants to use you to help save other people. He wants to make your life count eternally 
for His glory. And that has indescribable value. And it brings in immense glory to Him. You know, when you're Joseph and, you're, and you've been wronged by your brothers, sold as a slave, that is the lowest you can go. So incredibly humiliating and it is distressing because you're in, in absolute um, horrible circumstances. And then what he did is he would each time he would cling to the Lord and he would go back to his values. What does the Lord want from me? What is the what is the relationship with the Lord one? I cling to the Lord. I press into Him, and I do what He wants me to do, even in the crisis. And what that then does is the Lord f is favorable upon Him, and actually, actually in that terrible circumstance, He brings Him up, and He gives Him hope, and He gives Him favor. And then He's smacked it down again by Satan and people's sin, and He's left in prison to rot there. But then He rises up again, trusting the Lord doing his best in that circumstance and the Lord uses that to bless him and in the end the Lord exalts him and uses him powerfully but even there when his brothers is before him he's, he's, they are before him he's broken in his heart and he forgives them again not initially but, but later on he forgives them but it was just testing them as well and, but you know um, and so out of his pain and, his, and the problems and the and the situation that seemed like it's never going to end, the Lord changed it and he brought some life out of it. So I've had similar experiences. The point here is continue to walk with the Lord, continue to press through. Some people say, but this marriage of, my, of ours is never going to end. This is a terrible marriage. Yes, and there sometimes we need intervention in the marriage. But it doesn't mean that if you've not tried everything you haven't tried everything and you need other people's help if some people have dropped you they've st stabbed you in the back other they might there will be others that won't do it reach out for help still because your life is so much worth so much more not just to god and yourself but there are other people that care i'm sure of it that in your life there will be at least one person that cares and you know what's what's something that's striking to me as well if you commit suicide now, and let's say in eight months' time, you could, you could look back. You might actually regret your decision. Um, so when you're in the situation, why not look for every other possible way out? And if there's no human way out, I mean, do you call on the Lord always, whether it's a human way out or not. But you, you call on the Lord because that's if that's ultimately. The, the bigger power in your life and it's just trying one more time and trusting God one more time but some people have committed suicide but you know what even then God has used their lives still they were there was a, a pastor Jared Wilson that committed suicide um, I've got an article open here he committed suicide in in um, the US he was actually a pastor working with mental health and suicide awareness and he had depression and anxiety, and um, and he he committed suicide. So which, and then other other lead pastors of other uh, huge churches who also came forth and said, "Look, I'm battling with anxiety and depression." And so there's a lot of things that are a lot of people, and you're not alone in this. Um, and I must tell you that as a clinician, we are trained to work with this, and there's a lot of things that can be done. But, you know, I felt so much relief as well many a times when I've reached out for help. Um, so suicide is the last possible option. And for a Christian, you actually want to say it is not an option. But I'm not condemning those who have done it. But I want to say to you, the Lord is after you. He loves you. He's pursuing you like a lover that's pursuing his loved one. And he wants to help you. He's actually stretching out his arms wanting to help you. So my prayer for you is that you will hear the voice of the Lord and reach out to somebody and talk about your problems. And if people have hurt you and they're the source of your hopelessness, reach out to a professional person. And if they have been useless, reach out to somebody else. There will be somebody. Otherwise, phone me, you know, email me. But may God bless you richly and help you with this. And may he send you hope. 
for the future. That is, uh, and and in the word of God, there's hope. So, um, and that I just want to end with this: that the life on earth is is temporary, and we have an eternal blessed hope in Christ. So, it, the point of living here is to use this time wisely, to bless the Lord and to be used by Him, to help others and to make a difference in this wicked world where the Lord's light wants to shine. And if you don't feel worthy, you're right, you're not worthy. Christ is worthy. You don't have to be worthy. You are loved by God, even though you don't feel worthy. You've done sin. He still loves you. He wants to use you. That's why he sent Christ. He wants to forgive you. So put your hand in his. Okay. God bless you. If you're watching this on Facebook, please go and like our YouTube channel, subscribe there, and um, and visit our website one of these days we have a new website up and running uh, so god bless you it's nice talking to you please feel free to email me as well at erich at matters of the soul dot org god bless you goodbye <laughs>